Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good to see you all in the house of the Lord this evening. Welcome to all of you here on this uh, getting some end of summer days. It's been nice and warm out the last couple of days. Good to have that. Um, welcome to all of you online. I don't, I don't have my phone with me. We're using it to record to, or to, to live stream, but welcome if you're online. Uh, my mom and dad and Dana Connie usually, and anyone else who's online, welcome, welcome, glad you're with us. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with a few announcements here to begin with. I'll put this down here. Um, let's see here. So this is Alabaster Month. September's Alabaster Month, and anything that comes in specifically in the Alabaster boxes will go towards building churches and renovating churches. Uh, for the for the Nazarene Church. So if you need a box, see the pastor, or, there, or there's some out there in the hallway, or back there on the table. Take those with you, fill them up, and bring in. And we put those, those all into, go into a separate offering to the denomination, and they go specifically to building and renovating churches. So I uh, hope you'll support that. Um, Saturday, September 14th at 9 a.m. Uh, is the kickoff for this fall's Ladies Bible Study. That will be held in the Fellowship Hall, and it will happen every other Saturday. So I see a lot of ladies signed up. Uh, please plan on attending. We got you a book. So, again, that starts Saturday morning, September 14th, 9 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall, every other week then. Um, September 20th, ladies movie in a cookout, 6 p.m. Please be aware of that. I'm sure that's in the fellowship hall. Uh, September 21st is our quarterly birthday and anniversary party in the fellowship hall So at 5.30. So if you had a birthday or anniversary this quarter, please sign up on that sheet, and I hope you'll attend. It's always a good time of food and fellowship, laughter around the table. Friday, September 27th, is our next Red Cross Blood Drive in our Fellowship Hall. That is from 11.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. If you can give blood, please sign up. Or if you need me to sign you up, I can get online and do it manually for you. We're start, I, see, I started to see some people sign up this week. Uh, we're halfway to our goal. We're, I think we have 10 or 11 right now. So please sign up or invite someone else to sign up. We really... Uh, need to support that I mean there's no better way to help people than to give blood that's for sure as far as physically um, Saturday October 26th is our fall harvest party that's at 3 p.m. and then there's a note about uh, shirts we'll be ordering shirts whether you want to bring your own shirt in we have it embroidered or you want to order a shirt a specific color whether it's a t-shirt or a polo shirt whatever it is we'll have more information on that in the bulletin board and there are a few other announcements on the bulletin board please take note of those and then one last one i have is uh, the veterans ebt train ride october 4th we're filling up the train we're how where are we at now 107 and we can take how many 125 so there's a so now's the time to panic. If you haven't signed up and you're going to, do it now. Do it now. Now, we hope you will. Um, it, we, again, we'll, we can have, take 125. We have 107. We want to use all 125 seats. So if you're a veteran, please get a form, fill it out, and give it to David. Uh, if you know a veteran, give them a form. We'd love to have them come with us. It'll be a good time of fellowship on the train, a nice uh, a picnic dinner down there at Colgate Grove, some gospel music, and then ride back on the train. So uh, please, uh, if you know of a veteran, grab one of those, those forms and give that to them. I think that's all in the way of announcements. All right, so turn with me in your hymn notice, hymn number 719, Revive Us Again, 719. Praise Thee, O God, for Thy 
thy spirit of light who has shown us our savior and scattered our night hallelujah thine the glory hallelujah amen hallelujah thine the glory revive us again oh glory and praise to the lamb that slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May he so be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Amen. Good singing. 721, there shall be showers of blessing. shall be showers of blessing this is the promise of love there shall be seasons refreshing sent from the savior above showers of blessing showers of blessing we need mercy drops round us are falling but for the showers we plead there shall be showers of blessing precious reviving again over the hills and the valleys sent of abundance of rain showers of blessing Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing. Send them upon us, O oh Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing. Come and now honor thy word. blessing we need mercy drops round us are falling but for the showers we plead there shall be showers of blessing day they might fall now as to god we're confessing now as on jesus we Seven twenty-three. The chorus send a great revival, and we're going to sing this two times through. Seven twenty-three. Send a great revival in my soul. Send a great revival in my soul. Let the Holy Spirit come and take control and send a great revival in my soul. Send a great revival in my soul. Send a great revival in my soul. Let the Holy Spirit Come and take control and send a great revival in my soul. Amen. That's what we all need. 
revived in our souls. The world beats in on us. The world tries to push itself on us or tries to make us into what it wants us to be. But if the Lord sends a revival in our soul, we'll be refreshed, we'll be renewed, and we'll be able to share God's love. So I hope that's your prayer, that God would send a great revival in your soul. But we're going to go ahead and take our offering this evening. If Daniel will come and uh, take up the offering. As always, thank you for your faithful giving, for supporting this church, supporting the ministries of this church, but most importantly, supporting the kingdom of God through your giving. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many wonderful blessings. We thank you for your goodness to each and every one of us. Lord, you have blessed us greatly. And Lord, as we give back just a small portion of that this evening, may you bless gift and giver. Bless this offering to the building of your kingdom to be used for your glory to reach souls. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. jump back to the beginning of the hymnal to hymn number two hymn number two holy 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 it's a favorite down at the Shirley home recently so uh, I've got a lot of practice singing this one because they've been singing a lot down there so number two me. 
four, glorify thy name. Number four. Seven, bless his holy name. And we'll sing this through, it goes through once, and we'll sing it all again. Uh, we'll do it twice through before we go to prayer. Bless his holy name. Within me, bless. 
What are your favorite traditions at, wet, at a wedding? Either at your own or at someone else's that you've witnessed. You better not kiss my bride. <laughs> no, no, I was at a wedding. Well, I'm sure you were. Well, I'm going to tell you what, I know there were several people in the receiving line that were trying to, and it was not going to happen. Well, I know there are some small people. I know. <laughs> Jim? I like it even better when the mothers-in-law, they go get the flame from them. Yeah, that's a little twist on it, isn't it? <laughs> what? <laughs> you never know. It, there are interesting things that people are doing now um, that are just, they seem so out of place in a wedding because typically... Um, probably in this group, many of us, if we were married, we were married in a church, and it was a sacred occasion as well as an, a joyous and a celebration. Um, what are some of the things that you just weren't too sure about when you saw them at a wedding? If somebody stood up and said, I don't think they should get married because, you know, they're cousins or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you got the wrong church. It sounds like a TV show too, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Weddings are interesting in today's society. This evening we're going to look at a parable about a wedding feast. What kinds of wedding feasts are mentioned in the Old Testament? Or well, excuse me, what kind of feasts are mentioned in the Old Testament? Uh-huh, there's at least one that lasts for a week. Do you know the name of it? Some people, the marriage feast would last for a week, sure. The rich people. Uh, wealthy people and kings, probably. Sure, sure. Um, feast of weeks. Feast of booths. Passover feast. Um, sometimes there was a feast at Purim. Does anybody know what book of the Bible we find Purim in? Esther. Yeah, yeah. And I may be mispronouncing that. Some of those words are, you know. So feasts are a big deal in the Old Testament. And the religious leaders would have known all of them. Jesus said at least twice in his ministry that he wasn't going to do something until he did it in the kingdom of God, like 
on the night that he was betrayed. He said, this is the last time I'll drink of the fruit of the vine until I do so in the kingdom of God. Um, feasts are a big deal. There's the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's going to be where we're all there and Jesus is there. And after all of the stuff that happens or doesn't happen in Revelation, depending on whether it's already happened or not. So, Jesus uses this occasion to talk about a feast in the Eastern Oriental tradition. Matthew chapter 22. In the NIV it says the wedding banquet. Even that's an outdated word, isn't it? Banquet. Who goes to a banquet now? While you're finding your way there, I'll go over some of these prayer requests. Uh, Connie Mills and Donna Walker, Stanley Plank. Um, is that Nevaeh? Yeah. Nevaeh and Brittany. Uh, Abigail has a sore throat, and school has just begun. Yeah. Uh, Gerald Snyder, Polly and Kenny, of course. Uh, Debbie and Levon are traveling and continue to pray for Levon's husband. Um, why am I blanking on it? Larry? Daryl, thank you. Bible Adventure starting 924, and there are some um, um, times of training. Yeah. So uh, be, be praying for those that are involved, uh, the leaders and the children as they prepare for this. And the school that gets a little bit of a break once a week. Um, and pray for the teachers and so forth. And one of the things that I wanted to remember to talk about this evening for just a moment is those that are still, those that are still dealing with the after effects of 9-11 in their families. Uh, continue to pray for them and for the military. Uh, those, uh, some people that went into the military have served their 20 years already when they went in right after 9-11. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Um, people that graduate from college and high school have no memory of this for the past few years. Just like we didn't have any memory of the big one or the big one too. Um, I don't even really have that much memory of Nixon, to be honest with you. Um, but we'll pray, pray for our military and for those that have served and those that are dealing with issues as veterans. Um, I know that we in this area have the opportunity to serve veterans. Um, pray also for Samaritan's Purse. They have a very, very um, wide veterans ministry as well. One of my friends serves to head that up. Um, and they take uh, veterans and their spouses quite often to Alaska and other places so they can get away. And uh, we need to pray for more opportunities like that. Anything else? Unspoken request, I'm sure. Yeah. Those that we're praying for for salvation. <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we quiet our hearts, the tendency is to think about all of the things, issues, and problems that are going on in our life. Some of the things we don't have any control over. And these are the kinds of things that you ask us to bring to you, to allow you to have an impact in these areas, and to allow allow you to see that we trust you with them. As we lift our hearts to you, uh, we pray for those that we are, um, we, we know that they just need you, Lord, in salvation, some that need you in healing, some that need you um, to intervene in their circumstances to draw them to yourself. We pray for each of these that we've mentioned out loud, Father, that you would draw them close and let them know that we're praying for them and that uh, your presence is there. We pray for Bible adventure, 
for um, the leadership, uh, for the many Bible adventures that will be happening around the state of Pennsylvania. We ask that you would work uh, through the ministry of Joy L and those that are volunteers to touch the hearts of children all across the state. Father, we ask that you would allow there to be um, salvation that takes place, uh, growth that takes place, that your word through scripture memory and reading would take hold of the hearts of young people, Father. We pray for um, th those that have served our country and are serving now. Sometimes in uncertain times and many times, um, not really understanding what they're doing. Uh, Father, we pray for the leadership of the military. Uh, we pray that uh, you would allow there to be a revival there. We pray for our chaplains, both in the Church of the Nazarene and in other denominations that serve our military. Um, that you would allow them to have an impact, not just in counseling, but as they share the message of the gospel, Father. We ask this evening that you would allow us to see your word in a new light, or a different light. Something that allows us to take something with us this evening that uh, changes the way we think about you, the grace that you have uh, so graciously made available to us, Father, um, or the way that we look at others. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Weddings. Whew. Chapter 22 in Matthew is not the same parable that we find in Luke. Uh, there are several main differences, and we'll point those out as we go through. Chapter 22, verse 1, follows the end, of, obviously, of chapter 22, and it says, When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. As we read this, we find out that the kingdom of heaven is like a king the initiator of the banquet for his son. We can see, looking back on it, that it represents Jesus himself and the Father. We can see that. It's pretty clear. Um, you don't have to like read something into it. Um, but in this moment, even though those who were hearing it didn't understand it completely, there is this... Um, celebration that they knew would be part of the banquet, the meal, or the feast. He sent his servants to those who had been invited. Um, one of the things I want us to remember, we are all being called. But the Jewish nation, the Hebrew nation, through all the way back to Abraham, was called specifically by God specifically by God, to have a relationship with him. And at Mount Sinai, there was a covenant relationship that began. So this invitation was already sent out. Many of you see, you get save the date cards, right? Save the date. Um, in other words, we want to invite you, but we don't want to send the invitation yet. I want you to know that we're going to invite you. We're not keeping you out of the loop. We're, so this is the same kind of thing. Those who were invited already knew they were invited. So these servants went to tell them it's coming. 
Verse 4, so they refused to come. Isn't that odd? It's odd, right? At this point in the parable, people would have been thinking, free food, maybe more, because we're talking Oriental in the, in the East. You know, a lot of times the king's going to give gifts to everybody who's invited, and you don't want to miss that. Verse 4 says, Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My ox and the fatted cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. Um, if you were going to serve food, you butchered in the morning, and you cooked it all day, and once it's ready, it's ready. Now, this might seem strange to us, but he sent the servants, more servants out. Um, who do you think the servants represent? Yeah, prophets. Um, in, some, in some places, kings who led the people back to God. Uh, prominent people who served. Uh, you could even consider, some people might even consider the judges, those that were trying to bring God's people along helping them to recognize that they were invited by God to participate in God's specific kingdom on earth during that time where he was king. He wanted it to be a theocracy, but he acquiesced to their you know, request for a king in Saul and following. So let's read on. Verse 6 says, But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest, the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Let's stop there for a minute. What do you think the significance of one to his field and one to his business? If you're going to your field, you own it. What you own or what you desire to earn there's, a, there's categories there. So the things of this world, what they owned and what they could earn were more important than the banquet, the feast. And then there were those that were just downright upset at the fact that the king expected them to take ta time out of their busy schedule to come to the banquet because, you know, it's kind of inconvenient or for whatever the reason. You can see again in this parable the ways that the prophets were mistreated or even put to death. Jesus says on more than one occasion, um, you put them to death, those that were sent, and you're going to kill me too. Whalen? What else does this sound like? Anything else? Sounds like the other parables. It really does. It's several ways of saying the same thing. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. That to me seems a little out of place because... In the other parables, there isn't any immediate, there's not always an immediate repercussion. Well, I definitely think we can see future here, but if we read the whole parable, the kingdom is immediately taken from those and given to others. So the second, the first part of this parable ends kind of here. Jeff? It sounds to me like it's right with the rapture or tri tribulation because you go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, you go to the wedding, but, but while the church is called off, 
in the tribulation starts in the judgment. Sounds to me like the that so if if we try to put what we believe about Revelation or the end of time on this, we miss what he's saying to the present day. And the present day, he's saying, you guys were called by God to be his people. And yes, it is looking forward. It is definitely a forward look to the end of time. But he's saying right now, you need to know you've rejected him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's more like the ten virgins being ready. Because the rest of the parable kind of illustrates it. <laughs> yes. Not yet. We're included in the next part of the parable. And this, up until this point in the parable, we haven't been included yet. It is. It is. And this, this statement by Jesus is amazing, and it's one of the things that the Jewish people feared the most, especially those in leadership. It is not a hidden fact. When you read Isaiah, you will see it time and again. You are to be a light to the Gentiles to draw them to me. But they didn't want that to happen. Not, I mean, not in Jesus' current culture. We can see they didn't want that to happen. Yes, absolutely. That, the same attitude, yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. A kingdom of priests. Bill? They refused to share because they had power. And they like men like power. That's right. They had temporary power. And they traded that and lost their eternal power. They really did. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. If you gain the whole world and lose your soul. So verse 8 says, Then, after this, then, he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. That's quite a statement. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. There is a huge statement of grace here. There can be. Again, if we try to read too much into parables, we usually end up stretching them further than they were probably intended. <clears throat> four or five, uh, well, five, verse 5, I think the people that put their uh, uh, desires for the things of the world first. Exactly. And then verse 6, it's just the evil people. People who wanted to reject anything that God desired of them yes. that they didn't like. That's right. And you don't have to be a hell's angel to get found. Because when we read this second part, we see an amazing grace for the rest of us that we're not born into the nation of Hebrews. The idea of predestination probably would be wiser to do as a subject all by itself, but I understand where you're headed, Waylon, because the fact that all of us, it's available to everyone, or it's available to no one. No, no, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm just, I'm just trying to say it a little bit differently because... The, when you say predestination, you and I think one thing, but depending on what tradition you're from, you might be thinking something else. Yeah. yeah. I, I just think that, again, when I, when I talk to people who believe in predestination, it's interesting, we're little nuggets. We find all through Scripture. Like, this one little nugget. It, that's not the point here. This 
And you see, you see, an action can prevent you. Your action can prevent you from being at the banquet. Yeah. And it's okay for us to believe in some of these extra scriptural things that give other traditions headaches. They're not going to keep us from heaven. They're not. They're really not. But I see when we take all of scripture together, it's difficult sometimes especially if we've been at the church for in the church for a long time to take the parable at face value without reading into some of the things that we know are part of the scripture too but that's the privilege of believers who studied scripture sometimes god will help us to understand something else we're dealing with in scripture through a parable that might not necessarily be exactly what it was designed for does that make sense Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. And then he goes further. It says, so the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. If we follow the thread, if we follow the thread that the original people were invited, they rejected it, and they were punished. Then we can follow the thread that says, even a person who didn't necessarily know they needed to be there, once they were invited, if they accept the invitation, they move from the bad category to the good category. I'm not trying to overstate that. I'm just trying to say it doesn't sound right, but it is right. Yes. But we want to make sure we get there. We want to make sure we get to the point where we understand everyone is called and invited. The good and the bad. The accepting of the invitation is individual. Thank you, Bill. That's right. So, wedding hall is filled with guests. So, in order to enter the wedding feast the idea is that the king or the person throwing the wedding for their son would give gifts in this situation the culture around what jesus was right in they must have given garments kings in fact there are records of kings having warehouses of clothes so that they could give them out at every feast and it would be something obviously that was treasured because you need clothing, shelter, water, and food. And this clothing was exquisite. So this is not out of the ordinary. But in order for you to wear your own clothes in, you were saying to the person who provided the gift, what? I'm better than you, I don't need it. You, you could read that into there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard for us to picture this because if we arrived at a wedding in our suit or in our gown and they wanted us to put something else on, that would be really odd. Well, what do I do with my clothes? But, if you follow the analogy that these people were out on the street and they said, free food? Okay. And the king, he's probably going to give gifts. They head out. They don't go home and change. They, who knows what they were wearing in the mind of those listening to the parable. That's, that wouldn't match the parable because we as Gentiles in that culture 
wouldn't understand until after Christ the reality of what God had done to the Jewish people. So that would probably be a stretch. But in our thinking, when we hear this parable, I would think that, well, why wasn't I invited to begin with? That's not an unfair statement. The truth. Sure, sure. So verse 11, Jesus moves right through this. He doesn't pause, he just right through it. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Listen to the way he approaches him. There's grace here. He doesn't say, you moron, what are you wearing? He says, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. There was no excuse. There was nothing to say. If he would have said, I thought my clothes would be okay, or if he said something, it would give the king the opportunity to say, well, that's pretty offensive to me when I offered you, or whatever that looks, no matter the case, the king says, come on, guys, bind them up and throw them out. Now, you can see that it's a parable because of what, how he ends this. He says, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You're going to regret the fact that you rejected the gift that was available from the king. The ability to be in right relationship with the king. For many are invited, but few are chosen. And that's a very strange statement, isn't it? Many are invited, few are chosen. He, we, we're only given an instance by Jesus of one person that didn't take the wedding garment. But it opens the door for us to think about what might happen when we look at the big picture. The people of God in Israel rejected Jesus. They rejected who He was. They said, you're not the Messiah. They crucified Him. But can we always remember... Can we always remember that there's always a remnant? God, and Paul says this in Romans, does that mean all Jews rejected? No. Just like in the Old Testament, he says, there's always been a remnant that God kept for Himself. That people, the people that accepted who Jesus was. The disciples, we learn later in Acts, some of the priests, and obviously many people, thousands, but in this parable, we find that as a nation, they rejected and they were set aside. And yet, the banquet was given to people who they thought didn't deserve it. The Gentiles. Looking back on it, we can see the categories a little bit more clearer than maybe the people who heard it first. Something else we see there? We see it today. Be a little bit more, elaborate a little bit. Well, think about it. In Israel, there are uh, those that uh, I'm going to call them Jews that were turned off from Christ. The Orthodox and the Hasidic well, Jews? Yeah, they are not friendly towards Christians. No, because we believe Jesus is Messiah. In fact, it's, it's a huge tradition. I don't know what it's like in this area, but where I grew up, just south of Baltimore, just north of D.C., <laughs> on certain Christian holidays, the Jewish community would get together and volunteer at local hospitals and nursing homes. That was, that was their thing. We know that the Christians want to go and celebrate. We don't celebrate that, so we'll volunteer. 
those that were Jewish who uh, didn't celebrate those things, they would work on the Christian holidays in those hospitals, and vice versa. Some Christians would work for the Jewish people in those hospitals when they had their holy days. There's no reason we can't be kind to one another, right? But we need to be able to share the truth that Jesus is Messiah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, for my own part, what I see across the world has to be a group of people that have to really convince themselves of something. Because if you go through the Old Testament and then you allow yourself to set the Old Testament law aside, even though you believe Messiah hasn't come, where does that leave you? It leaves you as a civic organization. If I've heard stories from different Jewish people that, that got saved and their family rejects them. Sure. They can't, they're not even welcome to come visit. Isn't it interesting that there are more religious people that shun their own than other organizations or groups of people? Over religion. <laughs> Up until, what, 20 years ago, the Amish people would do the same thing. I find it very interesting that we think, somehow, that we're going to understand God's Word so well that we can shut out someone else from our life and influence that might bring them closer to the Gospel. It seems so counterintuitive. <laughs> Just so you know, that was a myth. That's reality TV for money. <laughs> it sold a lot of books too. I mean, how many? Uh, how many? Um, what's the big the big book publisher that makes all the you know Amish and stuff? You can only say the shunning so many times in a title of a book, but there's a bunch of them. <laughs> they sell a lot. For many are invited, but few are chosen also applies to the church. I want to be clear that we understand that. We have to have a personal growing relationship with Christ in order to know that we are obeying His commands and following what He taught. On a daily basis. Let us not consider ourselves to have, like Paul says, already reached where I'm supposed to, already attained to everything. Um, he's, he is an incredible writer and never feels like he has arrived. But he believes so strongly, Paul believes so strongly, that living the life is the priority. Everything else is temporary. Jesus is our example. And He enrages the religious leaders of the day. Sometimes, I, I know it's 8 o'clock, but sometimes I think about what parables would Jesus tell today? Yeah, but I think they would be very culture appropriate. They would relate to us. Yeah, I mean, he referred to, like, the names might change, but the situation would be the same. Yeah. But I wonder what it would look like in the information age, you know? You know, we went to see the Ark Center in Kentucky. Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And how they were dressed. And then they had a modern time where they had an event. And it was the same actors and actresses that they were dressed in. <laughs> but the scenario yeah. was the same. It just, you know, the time period. 
trade was different. I, I thought that was interesting how you did that. I think there are opportunities for us as believers to look into places like the ark. Um, I find it very, very strange. I find it very, very strange that Christians will support something like that they believe will reach other people, but it becomes, in some ways, if they're not careful, just like any other amusement park. I'm not saying don't go. Appreciate the fact that this is how big it would have been and this is what it might look like inside. I'm not saying that at all. Um, I mean, when I was a teenager, we had people talking about uh, what can you do with, you know, 10, I think it was $10 million. Uh, you can reach this many people or you can build a crystal cathedral. Any of you remember that? Yeah. Let us be careful. I don't want to be judgmental. I want to say... There are many ways for us to reach people with the message of the gospel. But the main thing you and I are responsible for is to remember that we've been invited and live as if God is telling the truth. It is. No matter what we believe about Revelation or Daniel, the fact remains Jesus is coming again. And he's going to take us to be where he is. That's his words. I know Revelation is his words as well, but that's a lot more comforting to me. I'm going to be where Jesus is. Where to be with him now? Um, the hope of what we have to look forward to and the peace to live now. Yeah. Because he walks with us now. He does walk with us now. In fact, many people, as a side note, many people probably would think I'm crazy about what I believe about end times. But I believe much of Revelation and much of Daniel have already been fulfilled. I believe that when people began calling it the Great Tribulation, when it never says that in Scripture, there will be tribulation. They call it the Great Tribulation because there's a way to see seven years, three and a half and three and a half in Revelation. But I honestly think that John had so few words to describe something that is indescribable that when we look at Revelation, we should remember who wins in the end, who was faithful, who was not, and that there is nothing that can counteract God's original plan for us. Yeah, Jeff. And that whole alignment only happens every 7,000 years. Revelation 12. Yeah, with uh, the given birth, I'm talking about the 12 stars. The 12 stars. I'm looking. Just that exactly as it's described in Revelation 12. In the whole I'm sorry, I'm not seeing that. <laughs> and so if you believe that it's been 6,000 years since Adam, then he probably might be able to I'm looking for the 12 stars, but I don't see that. Now it came... A great and wondrous sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. I don't understand what you mean by that's been fulfilled. Uh, it's the, uh, the virgin, I don't remember her name, the, you know how you have different... Uh, Constellations? Constellations, yeah. Virgo, is it? The Virgo. Whew! All right, well, I'm just going to tell you right now, I don't think this is probably a discussion I want to have while I'm online, but we can, we can talk about that in a minute. 
Let's go ahead and pray, and then we can talk about that for anybody that wants to stay and talk about that. Father, we do thank you for your word, that it is true, and we know who wins in the end. We ask that we might be challenged by the statement, all are called, few are chosen, that we might be diligently seeking your face through your word and through the fellowship of the believers. In Jesus' name, amen.